Hey now everybody, welcome to episode 200 of the Take Aim Outdoor Podcast and as always I'm your host Brandon Hammonds and couldn't be more happy to get number 200 out to everybody. This week I have Chris Derrick on from Sitka Gear. Chris is the Whitetail brand manager that specialized just on the Whitetail side for the products for Sitka Gear and as we all know Sitka Gear is known for for basically bringing technical garments to the market and uh, that's pretty much what we talked about in this episode is all the technical aspect of the whitetail side and uh, hope you guys enjoy number 200. All right, everybody, we are live, brand new Take Aim podcast, and uh, always excited to get a new show out, and always excited to talk with great people and about good gear, and uh, super excited to talk to Chris Derrick from Sitka Gear, the Whitetail Brand Manager, and talk about just some of the stuff Sitka's got going on and the Whitetail side of stuff. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Not a problem, man. Super excited to talk to you and uh, just kind of get into a little bit of what Sitka does and and, and basically kind of how it's morphed into the whitetail side to what I would call now is probably some of the best product and clothing on the market for us whitetail bow hunters, even here in the Midwest. Yeah, we, we like to put a lot of effort. Uh, we spend a lot of time um, in just doing uh, in-field validation as well as in the lab validation. Um, and uh, that's something that that's really important to us. We we won't bring something out until we feel, feel that it is uh, right where we want it to be, and uh, it's a big part of what we do. So um, we we don't want anybody to have a bad experience, uh, and uh, we also spend a lot of time just trying to learn and 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 advance uh, the gear as we go. Yeah, for sure. I know years ago, and I kind of mentioned this before the show that it seemed like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like years ago when technical clothing kind of hit the market and it's really only been, I don't know, what would you say, Chris, 10 years, maybe, maybe just over that. Yeah. Our founder, Jonathan Hart, uh, from, from the way I understand it, it was obviously before I was around, but uh, uh, you know, he, he was out in the field and they were doing some, you know, mountain style hunts and, and uh, they were having a pretty terrible experience because the gear was, was developed, uh, not for that type of pursuit, um, and so what he really took is the same approach that you'd you'd see in, in a mountain gear uh, base brand, and and started to uh, make sure that they were developing uh, world class and best in class product for for those style of uses. If it, if if it's good for that style of use, then um, you know, and you refine it for the hunt specific uh, pursuit, then then you've got um, everything you need. Yeah, for sure. I think that. You know, I kind of remember Sitka, you know, specializing in mountain gear, and now it's it's morphed to being categorized, and now you guys have this awesome, you know, whitetail side. And w- when about did you guys get into the whitetail side of the market? Uh, it's been about, uh, I, I think it, it's been about six years um, that, that Sitka really started to make a push, but it was around 2015 uh, that's when Elevated 2 uh, took off, and uh, I think, you know, that that uh, uh, has has really, um, a lot of people have have been drawn to to what the, what the group did at, at that point and, and developing uh, really great products. Um, you know, when you, when I look at the whitetail pursuit, uh, everything we're doing is, you know, you might have uh, a short period of, of ex- exertion, um, and then followed by, you know, really long stationary sits. Uh, and so it, you were talking about from just the mountain sports application and how you're, you're managing moisture in both applications is really important um, because if you get sweated up and then you go to sit still, still uh, that's, that's uh, a miserable, miserable experience and, and nobody wants to be put in that situation. So uh, that's, that's how the approach we take. And, and just to give everybody some context in the way that we're set up is we, we approach uh, each of the, the hunt specific categories. So we have somebody that's in charge for fit for use applications for waterfowl. For example, uh, Jim Sabier, all he works on is uh, waterfowl specific product. Um, John Barklow, 
uh, works on the big game side. So that's going to be elk, mule deer, pronghorn, you know, moose hunts up in Alaska or, or BC. And then, uh, and then my, my role inside the company is just working specifically on whitetail products. So anything that's um, specific fit for use for hunting whitetails uh, is, is what I spend my days working on. Well, that's cool. Well, if you could, Chris, take us behind the curtain, so to speak. You guys have had, um, you know, basically, I think a lot of people would recognize like the Fanatic line, um, and now you guys have an early season line. But let's go back to the kind of the origins and kind of your role and how you, uh, just like I said, behind the curtain, so to speak, how you guys have, uh, you know, changed that stuff from maybe different threads to just removing some bulk and, and just some of the technical aspects to make it actually when I've learned about Sitka, you guys have, or the white tail side now, you guys have really kind of morphed into very thought out, well thought out uh, process to all this gear. Um, and just, I think it's kind of amazing to kind of get maybe, like I said, behind the scenes, you know, look at how you guys do that because everything is so well thought out from where, you know, uh, uh, what which jacket is it, Chris? Just to give an example, the the new one you guys have, where uh, is it? The fanatic, the new fanatic with the uh, the safety harness that you don't have to take the coke completely off to get that through. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's uh, that is the new fanatic. It'll be out in uh, summer of 2019, uh, obviously right before um, hunting season. But a lot of people have seen it at the uh, ATA trade show, um, uh, for example, and. Uh, uh, you know that was a that's a product that's really designed for ultra cold weather uh, conditions. So you're looking, you know, f- freezing temperatures to, uh, you know, sub zero, uh, negative twenty degree, uh, you know, type type temperatures. If you're if you're hunting up where you are or in Canada, you guys just got done with your wonderful polar vortex. So you, that would be the suit for for those days. Um, and with the, what you were referring to, the Constant Connect safety harness port, um, one of the things, you know, when we looked at the old Fanatic, it was really, everyone was like, how can you make that even better? But we try and never sit with where we're, we're at. Um, so the whole approach with that product is trying to figure out how do we take it from where it is as a, as a, a really good, you know, great product of what it is for keeping you, you warm in those ultra cold weather conditions. But then how can we learn from what we've, uh, had some years and experience with it. We've listened to people that have talked about using it, uh, and there's always some things that we can do to make things better. And one of them specifically that you talked about there was the Constant Connect safety harness port. So um, technically the right way if you're tethered into a safety harness um, when you're up in, the, in a tree is to take your lineman's rope if, you, if you've climbed up your sticks, throw that around the tree, uh, disconnect from um, the 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 tree tether from where it's attached to the tree. Run that through the harness port, and the reason we, the, you'll see the harness port in all of our jackets is, it, otherwise uh, your hood will interfere with it, or let's say it's just sitting up against your your neck, which can be a, really uncomfortable. And then with the new constant connect, essentially just imagine the back of the collar being able to uh, to to break apart. And it's a, there's a slide to lock, a snap on there. So if, if you're putting on or pulling off the jacket, the snap won't just pop off. So you're going you're gonna to slide it horizontally to release the snap, and it opens up. And there's some magnets that, that hold the uh, closure shut. You can take off the jacket without ever disconnecting from the tree stand and going through that whole process. Because one thing you want to never do, uh, I'm sure we've all heard horror stories of, of people that are falling uh, out of a, a tree stand, and, and that was a really big safety uh, uh, concern was just making sure that, that that's done the right way. And then also there's just a, a speed aspect of it. You want to be moving as little as possible. Um, so, you know, the more time you're you're moving around, uh, taking on and off a jacket, that's they always seem to show up, right, when you least expect them. Um, so, and, and they, they definitely can cue in on movement. And that was one of the reasons behind that, that update on the constant connect safety on sport. Yeah, that is, it's a really awesome, uh, feature for any stand bow hunter. Uh, you know, one thing I t- kind of get back to my original lengthy question there, Chris, is, uh, where do you guys kind of get that feedback from and, and to come up with a design like that to make a jacket that was really good even better 
Is it from in the field to use from, you know, guys that are hunting would, all the time or just design? Yeah, I would say, I would say it's from three areas. Um, first one is we, we have a team of, uh, what we call, there's about 40, about mid forties, uh, 47 or so, uh, whitetail, what we call ambassadors or SWAT team. Those are in use, uh, field users that I'll send product out to, uh, they're, they're, they spend a lot of time hunting. They're, you know, from anywhere from Michigan to PA to Louisiana to Florida, you know, and over in through the Midwest, uh, states. So they can give you really balanced opinions. Uh, there are people that I trust to be able to give feedback. So I would say that that would be the group that we have, uh, that, that I've got a direct line of contact. The other is uh, just through customer service here. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm speaking to our customer service team all the time. People also, you know, just like I might be having a conversation with you, for example, and you might be able to point me in the direction on, a, on an update or a suggestion. I file that away. I look for common threads. And then the last one is in, in field. I, I go out and I spend time uh, hunting in this product. Uh, I, I don't think there's a substitute for that. Um, and so I, I'll make sure that I spend time in the tree stand. I always kind of roll, say I'm, I'm kind of a rolling mess in the tree stand because I'm always trying new things. <laughs> um, so uh, a lot of times I'll be playing around, maybe doing a new pack. And then, you know, I've left something in the last pack I was testing that morning. Um, so those are those are things that I try and do is put myself in the different situations and then just try and hunt with some various different people to watch how they're in, engaging with the product as well to to be able to make it a, a lot better than than where it currently is. Yeah, that's 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 pretty awesome feedback. I mean, especially to hear you guys you you mentioned the uh, you know listening and talking to customer service because. Uh, that's probably something we we take for granted as a user is is that feedback to you guys, and it's probably pretty pretty important, and it, it's probably something we never think of, but you guys probably use that feedback probably quite a bit, way more than I would ever think. Yeah, I I enjoy talking to them, and and the one thing I've noticed from you know the Sika side, I mean, it it, it is the really best customer service team I've actually ever seen. Uh, in order to be in that department, you actually have to hunt. Um, so that everybody inside of there uh, actually cares about the product and actually uses it in the field. And so I, I think that's something that, you know, if you call in the customer service or you reach out to them, that they will, they will help you solve your problem. They will do the best that they can. So uh, I have a lot of respect for that team inside of our company. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I, let's stick with the Fanatic series for a minute, Chris. What what else are we looking for in that jacket as an outwear? Um, I know you said it's it's basically your your heavier version, your cold version, I would call it. So colder temps. Uh, what kind of fabric is the outside? Is it is it uh, like the tight nap stuff? Is it very waterproof or noisy? Not noisy. I know you guys made improvements even down to the zippers, which I think is amazing, and you could talk about, but just describe some of the, obviously the, the sound is super important to us bow hunters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Fanatic system uh, includes um, the Fanatic hoodie, the Fanatic love, and then new updated this year uh, is the Fanatic jacket. Uh, there's a vest as well. Uh, there's a bib, and then there's also uh, what's called the Fanatic pack. And each of those items that are new and updated this year are really developed around advancing the science of sound. Um, so a lot of the features that are inside here, not to say that you couldn't use it for gun hunting because it's, it's great. Uh, all of these features advance those for, for anyone that's using a firearm in the field, but also um, just if you're at really close engagement distance, you know, inside 40 yards, uh, sound makes a huge difference. Um, and, you know, the, the way that uh, deer here makes a big difference. So what we did is we spent a lot of time analyzing um, how we could make that product quieter. So we wanted to maintain the fact that it's wind stopper. So it's not like a waterproof product. This this is gear that's designed for stopping wind, cold environments. Uh, if you're looking for something that's cold, cold, wet conditions, uh, then you're going to look at something like the incinerator, which is uh, a, a Gore-Tex outer shell. It's, plain, it's rainproof. The Fanatic is, is all about warmth and quiet. Um, so we use the new Jacquard Berber face. Uh, that Berber face actually, it's not a, a print. 
uh, each one of the threads that comes out of the Berber is its own color. So the black's the black, you know, yarn, uh, the white's a, a white yarn, um, for example. And so what that really does is it improves the off-to-fade uh, print clarity on there, which is a, is a big difference. Uh, and then also on the jacket, you're going to see a left and right fit uh, design. So I, I don't know, you know, uh, how many of your listeners might be lefty uh, archers, um, but the, the, everything on that jacket is there's actually now a, a left-handers version. So, so if you, that, that way everything is uh, ideally um, designed for if you're drawing a bow or you're shooting a firearm and you're left eye dominant, uh, that's going to really make a big difference. Um, and a lot of people ask why on the Fanatic, why it has that kind of a weird cross zip. So if you, if just to describe this, you'll, you'll reach across the side and the zipper actually starts around the side of your left hip. Uh, we moved it a little bit further forward uh, this year to just to make it a little bit easier on people. Um, but the reason that cross zip is there, it actually allows for a built-in hand muff. And if you reach your hands through and you can connect your hands, they're going to stay a lot warmer than if you just put them in a, uh, a, a standard hand pocket. That's why we all like muffs in, all, in cold, uh, cold, cold conditions versus just putting them in our hand pockets. Um, and we also built inside of there, just like the little details you were talking about, uh, there's a chemical hand warmer pocket. So one of the things that would happen in the field, if I was holding onto a chemical hand warmer in the muff in the old Fanatic, I might pull my hand out and fling that hand warmer to the ground, which either, you know, totally stinks because now I don't have that artificial heat source. Uh, second of all, a lot of times the reason I'm pulling my hand out of the muff is because I'm reaching for my bow to engage a deer. And that little bit of movement could really blow the whole, the whole thing for you. And then when we were talking about the left and right fit design with that cross zip, um, you know, there's, there's now a stow collar. Uh, so if you flip the collar open, it stows on, on, a, on a dedicated um, magnet uh, hold point. And there's actually all optifade. So now the internal part of that jacket actually has the optifade um, on there as well. Uh, and then you'll see on like the grip arm for your, your, the, if you're reaching out and grabbing your bow, there's no Berber on that side, but then on your draw arm or your trigger arm, if you're shooting like a muzzlelid or a firearm, uh, you're going to see no Berber right on the inside of the elbow. And that's really all about uh, reducing bulk when you're at full draw or if you're, or if you're holding your firearm. Um, and uh, so those are some of the key differences. There's a range finder pocket, you know, where you can store your range finder quick and easily and uh, with that hold the grunt tube as well. Um, so that's really the update to the jacket, um, if that makes sense. And then also with the, the way that we analyzed the sound uh, when we went through this, uh, we, we partnered with a, a gentleman by the name of uh, James Black. He works at Montana State University. He's what you would call an acoustical engineer. And this guy, uh, he basically knows how sound works in environments. So if you want like a quieter office space or if you're at a concert venue, He's going to tell you how that sound engages in that environment. Um, so he could, he could tell us what's happening when we're moving in the tree stand. And then we partnered with Dr. Carl Miller, who's at the University of Georgia, um, and he's been studying whitetails for about 40-plus years. Uh, and he's, he told us, uh, and, and he helped provide us guidance on how deer are going to perceive uh, that noise that we're making. So they, they shift about two octaves higher uh, and frequency than our human hearing is. Um, so when you're making a move, if you've ever moved a rain jacket, have you ever taken your sleeve of your rain jacket and you hear that popping sound? Yep. That's called buckle, and that happens at about 125 hertz. But then if you take your hand and just rub it on your, your sleeve or you rub your, your sleeves together on your arms, uh, that, that sound is called rustle, and it happens about 3,000 plus hertz. And that's that's the sound that's actually right in the sweet spot for deer hearing. Uh, the buckle actually is what we think is outside the deer hearing. And through all the analysis that we did, we went into the Gore Comfort Lab, which is a climate room. We can go down to negative 50 degrees. Uh, we took it down to negative 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and um, what, that's about negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit for, for those that are out there. And the reason we chose that number is the microphones quit working past that temperature. Um, and we analyze the sound that, that you're going to be making while you're either drawing a bow, reaching for a rangefinder, or if you've, I'm sure you've frozen to a tree, for example, um, and, and that Velcro-y sound, 
uh, yeah, you make with sure. engaging at the tree. Yeah, we analyze that noise as well. Yeah, that is crazy. A lot of people don't know this about myself, but previously, my previous profession for 10 years, I worked in a wind tunnel that all we did was um, wind tunnel testing for sound. It was a soundproof tunnel, and everything was recorded, worked with uh, 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 audible engineers every day uh, for cars. And uh, I was I always was just curious, like, how in the world has that kind of technology not converted over to the hunting side at some point just for uh, you know, our clothing just because, I mean, the, it's one of their number one defenses is, is the sound and how well they hear. And uh, so that's really cool that you guys are doing stuff like that. Yeah, I, I actually would put sound on a higher um, than even scent because uh, there's, it, there's so much question on what actually uh, deer can, you know, what actually works out there in the marketplace. And it's very hard to, um, to pinpoint uh, the exact situation, but sound something that you can control. Um, and, uh, and so I would even put it at a higher priority uh, than scent. Yeah, I would too. Knowing what I know about the sound and how, uh, how just all of those animals from elk to deer, they just hear so well. And it is just key that, uh, I mean, you can't move if you're really paying attention to a deer that maybe has already locked in on you. I mean, that's all they're doing. Uh, if the wind's not in their face, they are just trying to remotely hear a pin drop. So, again, it's pretty neat that you guys are doing that. And, uh, Chris, how did you guys kind of come up with that the side zipper design? I know you said it was for the hand muff, but uh, – did that cause problems for design just being that it wasn't vertical and it, it bumping out or anything of that sort? Well, one of the things we were concerned, so we did move to a new style of zip, zipper. So we even went into, you know, the sound chamber, for example, and started moving um, zippers up and down slow, trying to evaluate uh, what sounds. So I'm sure you guys can all relate to uh, you know, sometimes if you ever put on your jacket and you start zipping it up, you're like, can I ever, can I ever actually get this zipper up? Because it just, it's so, it, it just sounds so noisy with all the, the clicking of the teeth coming together. So we, we analyzed and found the quietest zipper that was available out there to us that, that has um, the durability we need. Um, but that was one of the things just with that angled zipper, we had to go through and val validate uh, whether or not um, that, that would work in the field. Um, so, so, you know, always, you know, as soon as you start angling zippers, things, weird things can happen. So getting that shaping uh, down was exactly right. And then also where's, where's the head finish up on your face, um, for example, uh, and, 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 and then if you're stacking layers, you don't want a bunch of zippers right on top of each other. So we have to evaluate how that feels too for people. So yeah, those yeah, are some, sure. some of the big, oh, sorry, yeah. No, oh, no, I was no, just going to say underneath that, that's part of the, you know, Sitka has always been known as a system. So explain that a little bit from the um, design-wise, just how well thought out it is that what you just mentioned is true, that you even your base layer, I'll call them base layers, all of that stuff works as one. So you don't have any of that bunching in. Your medium fits really a medium, and you can order that in the same shirt and jacket and not be bucked up. And stuff like that you guys have really done the best job on the clothing side than anybody out there, in my opinion. Yeah, I call it, I mean, there's really three parts to it. One, one is setting your foundation. That's actually the most critical. A lot of people don't realize this, but, I mean, the reason in, you don't see cotton, for example, um, and uh, in, in mountaineering sports, there's a reason for that. You know, there's a saying that cotton kills. Well, when it gets wet, it's just going to, it doesn't add any insulating value. It actually makes you colder. Um, and so setting your foundation is super important. Um, so getting a good pair of base layers, I like to start with a lightweight synthetic um, or, or a lightweight wool base layer. Um, if you're taking your Fanatic or your Stratus or whatever product you're using and then you're wearing your blue jeans under it and you start to get sweated up on your walk-in or when you're climbing in, um, you're going to have a bad experience. Uh, it'll probably be better than it would with just all cotton. But what I'm saying is, is, you know, there's some responsibility on the hunter to understand how these systems work. 
Uh, and so, you know, part of the reason I like to talk um, to you is I think it's a great education point. You want to start with the right base layer. If you don't set that foundation correctly, if you're going out there and wearing your cotton T-shirt and your cotton blue jeans under your systems, uh, you're not optimizing your performance. Uh, you're not going to have as good an experience as you could if you set yourself up with the proper base layers. And then think about how you're going to commute into the stand. I commute in, for example, with as little of the layers. If I'm wearing my bibs, I typically commit to my bottom. So I'm going to vent, vent the legs on my bibs. I'm going to walk in with maybe just like a lightweight synthetic base layer on, or I'm going to have maybe my Fanatic hoodie if it's really cold outside. Um, I'll deal with a little bit cold on the way in. Uh, and then when I get up in the stand, as my body starts to cool, I will add my insulating layers. So, you know, going with a mid-layer lofted insulation jacket, um, and then, you know, adding on, for example, if it's ultra cold, I'll add my Fanatic jacket on later in that. You don't want to go in and walk several hundred yards wearing that in um, or with an incinerator on. Uh, you'll spontaneously combust. Um, so, it, you know, go ahead and take it off, pack it in. I think <laughs> you'll have a better day. Yeah, for sure. All that stuff makes sense. And it's funny that that's part of the evolution, I think, of what I'd call just us modern hunters just, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, you didn't hear about body mapping and and packing in clothes like that. And uh, it's just funny, you know, how how fast things changes and um, using synthetic clothing like that. I, I know, I mean, 18 years ago, I mean, everything I owned was cotton, you know, what you just said. And it just makes your whole day miserable. And there's nothing worse than being cold 20 minutes into a set after you just, you know, walked roughly 300, 400, 500 yards, it's the worst. And I remember those days vividly. And it, it, uh, it's great that we've come so far, you know, into this side of, of outwear and base layers. Yeah, I can remember when I was, I mean, in high school hunting, and you remember the, just the cotton coveralls you'd wear? Oh, yeah, and that's I'd look like still this, around. <laughs> I'd look like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, and... I remember, you know, where I was from, you know, getting down into the teens, you know, that's, uh, that, that was cold in the south. But I can remember barely, barely being able to get through those sits and just just being, looking like a Ralphie from the Christmas story. Um, and, and now I've, you know, I've hunted in, in gear and, and been um, fairly sleek and, and, tr and trim and not over bulked. Um, down to negative, you know, 20 degrees um, and been very, very comfortable. Uh, my face might, you know, be cold in those conditions, but, you know, but uh, uh, my core body warmth, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable in those conditions. And I've even been able to wear like a lightweight glove. So I'll take a merino wool liner, put on the Fanatic glove and then stick those in, a, in the, uh, the hand muff with some, with some artificial heat. And I've, I've been in a, a great situation to be able to stand those temperatures for, for very long sits. Yeah, that's really amazing because, uh, I mean, just like you, you, the cotton stuff and cotton overalls, and I just remember so much bulk, and it's just such a, uh, it's such a nice feeling now to go out and almost look like you're underdressed because you're not so bulked up. It's crazy to even think about, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then if anybody yeah. has any other questions on uh, some of the other updates, just to go into, uh, I know you, you had asked me to specifically go over this, but on the bibs, you know, one of the things we talked about is, is trying to make things better. So the original bibs uh, that we had in the Fanatic system, um, uh, you know, just even with the sound being on the half that audible engagement distance, but the lower leg of the bibs you're going to see actually now have uh, no Berber on them. Um, and we've map you talked about mapping. Uh, that's really all about burr pickup. Um, so one of the big complaints people had is, yeah, I tried tried to get through, but you know, inadvertently I picked up some bibs or some burrs on my bibs, and um, and then so we were able to be able to take that problem away. So there's nothing that's ultimately burr proof, but they're certainly easy to flick off um, and, and take off if you pick them pick them up. I used to take my old ones. For example, I've I've got uh, two young children. So they're starting to age out of this, but I. I'd pay them like, you know, 10 cents a burr to be able to pluck them out for me. And uh, <laughs> I wound up going bro broke. So. Uh, that's funny. But it's so true, though, especially here in the Midwest. And, I mean, probably 
maybe a little less in the West, but especially here in the Midwest. It, the burrs are horrible, and there's different types of burrs, and each one has a challenge with picking them out. And sometimes you do it in the tree stand just to, like, help pass the time. Uh, but between burrs and, and the wild, uh, you know, I call them like a wild rose bush with thorns on them, I mean, they, it's just littered in the Midwest, and that's always been a problem from snagging your pants, burn them up, and uh, that's really a great thought just to, I don't know about you, but I hate to take my clothes and pack them and have burrs on them because I just feel like they're they're dirty. You know what I mean? And then you're just yeah. getting burrs all over your house or your other clothes that you're putting in a scent tight bag or tote, and it's just never a good situation. Yeah, and those ones that just break apart into the ultra tiny burr, um, oh, those yeah. are the ones that I, they're just impossible to to uh, to get out. So um, I, I think you know that's. It, that was a really nice update. And now I'm, I personally, I'm even saving money. I, you wouldn't believe how many uh, they'd show up in their little plastic bag with all those birds. I'd be like, holy smokes. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that was, that was uh, um, just, you know, self-preservation, I think, right there. So how did you guys really combat that? Was it just making that, that um, Berber tighter or, how, or a different type of fabric altogether? It's, it's a different, it's a map, uh, so we, we chose a different textile. Uh, it's going to be a smooth face. If you think about where you're going to need Berber, uh, it's in your core body warmth area. Um, so you'll see that. I mean, it's the same textile we're using in the sleeve, so you're going to get a little bit less bulk in that area on your legs, which is great when you're, when you're climbing your sticks, uh, getting in and under your stand. Um, and, you know, it's, this, it's, it's a lower bulk uh, textile, but, um, you know, Burr's, I, they've evolved to be what birds, I mean, the whole, their whole survival, you know, the way they tr- transfer around is by sticking to things really well. You're not going to solve that. Um, so if they stick on it, the key is just to make them off, uh, get off easy and, and pick the key areas. So the front of the legs, um, inside of the crotch uh, gusset, for example, uh, and then along the hem of the jacket, all of those areas were the worst uh, problematic burr pickup areas. And now all of those have a smooth textile um, to be able to pull off. So even like the hem of the jacket, for example, uh, they always seem to wind up like right under the underside, and then they wind up making noise. Um, so they're they're really easy to pluck off uh, when they stick to that textile. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, is there any other changes that you guys do to the pants as well, Chris? Like zipper-wise or inside zippers around the calf or anything like that has changed. Um, so the zippers are the new quieter zipper. So if you're venting or don, or if you decide to pack in your your bibs, or if you just want to vent because it's you know the sun came up and you got warm, uh, that or you're you're going in, they're a lot quieter. Uh, the suspenders are a lot um, a lot less bulk uh, up on the front. So we use a, a different uh, uh, suspender system. Um, also, one of the changes with all of our bibs is we're no longer losing using natural rubber. Um, so if uh, um, you're using an ozone, like a scent crusher or ozonics uh, uh, type system where you're, you're running those in there, uh, one of the things like ozone, uh, you know, it kills yeah. natural uh, things. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Um, and if and some of the old uh, 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 elastic that the, on the uh, shoulder straps um, would be damaged by those. Um, and so that is um, uh, something that's an updated, so you can use them in any ozone chamber. Uh, if you have actually one that's uh, an old product that actually uses some of the natural rubber, uh, then we actually we can replace those for you. So one of the things we don't want people doing is just throwing their old gear away. Uh, that's not something, you know, just from a conservation and, and, and what we're – we don't want people just the, this gear is supposed to last a long time. So whether right. you're know, trading it down to the next person or you're keeping it in your line, we, we don't want you replacing your gear every year. But you can actually get your suspender sent in or your, your bib sent in to customer service, and they'll replace uh, the uh, suspender system on there for you. Um, so that's not using the natural rubber if you're using. So if you've damaged yours in the past, that's something we'll take care of for you. Um, and, you know, that's just really important to us. That's one of the things we do as a, as a service-oriented um, thing for our customers. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So the new system, Chris, is it like a, a synthetic rubber, or is it a totally different material altogether? 
Uh, yeah, it's just a synthetic, uh, so it's not going to, uh, it's not natural rubber. So one of the original suspenders that were in some of our bibs um, were, uh, were natural, had natural rubber component toward, to them. And obviously over the past couple of years, uh, ozone's becoming a really big thing from a scent control standpoint, and we want to make sure our gear stands up for that. So if you've got anything, if anybody's out there and they've damaged their gear, uh, just call uh, Sika Gear uh, Customer Service and they'll help you out. Um, and then uh, just as far as new other new products, we've got the new Fanatic Pack. Uh, this thing, uh, I spent, I worked with a guy named uh, Jim Holt Jr. out of uh, Alberta, um, and I, I kind of dubbed him the silent fanatic. Uh, he's, he's a person that, uh, you know, if he runs some, you and his outfitting uh, exercise, he won't, he won't let you go out in the field if your gear's not quiet. You're actually, even if you booked a hunt with him, he'll say, hey, uh, you can't go out because you're going to mess everything up for other people. And the reason that is, is his area is just the quietest area I've ever, ever been to from a hunting situation. And, um, and so he and I worked together on this development of this, this pack, laid all the gear out that we needed for that style of hunting. So there's, there's no exposed plastic parts or buckles. So, you know, a lot of us just use the side release buckles on packs. Uh, this one actually uses a silent closure system, kind of similar to a molly system. You drop things uh, like a kind of a, a silent webbing hook uh, that's reinforced through through a, a ported area, uh, and that holds pocket shuts, holds the top lid shut. Um, there's a uh, bow carry system on the front, so one of the things I don't like to do is set my pack down on the ground and then pull it up. So you can actually walk up to your tree, pull it up instantly, um, hang your pack, um, it's got a dedicated slot for your bow arm, so then you can pull that out, accessible from the outside of the pack. Um, screw that in, take the bow off the front of your pack, and then hang it up, and then you're ready to go. Um, and then also, if you're carrying uh, antlers uh, during the rut, you'll see two recessed ports that are just in the side, under the side pockets. Those are for the bases of your antlers. Um, for example, as well, so so it, it nests your antlers on the front and outside of the pack, or you can, or it has enough volume at 2,200 cubic inches to be able to put them inside. Yeah, that's a large size pack actually, which is really nice, and just really couple cool features that you just mentioned, obviously. But I mean, I don't know how many times I've I have packed, you know, like we talked about earlier, Chris, just you know, undoing your outer layer, putting it in, you know, strapping it in your backpack. Um, and it seems like every time it does not matter. It never fails. Once I undo those buckles, one of those buckles is going to hit something and ting. And uh, I just, it's probably hardly any noise, but it's just enough to drive me nuts. And I know if I hear it, a deer can hear it. So for you guys not to have any exposed, you know, buckle-like systems on that pack, I think is amazing. And the size itself is really cool. Um, I know another feature of that pack, I believe it's that pack, right, that you can kind of condense down while it's hanging in the stand. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So it, a lot of people look at it and, and you'll go, it, you'll kind of take a second take. And, and usually people take a, a, a trip or two to get used to it. Uh, and then all of a sudden it becomes their, their favorite pack uh, from people that uh, I've been able to give it to. Um, and so it's designed without structure on purpose. And the idea behind it when Jim and I were going, Jim Hull Jr. and I were going through that was the fact that it will collapse on itself when you empty it. So you're carrying all your gear in, um, and then obviously you're taking your jacket out, you're taking all of the stuff that you need out of usually the internal main compartment. And then the idea behind that is that the whole pack caves in on itself, and then rather you having the same 2,200 cubic inches showing in, in like a true sh a structured pack on the side of a, uh, of, a of your tree, uh, the whole thing is going to collapse in and go to a lower profile. Yeah, that's really cool. Really cool. It's nice to try to stay nice and tight against that tree and, and not have any of that excessive outline, bulky outline, so to speak. So that that's what a great feature that is. And obviously you talked about the rattle and antlers. Uh, that's another issue that I think everybody's had where you walk and they ting or make noise or when you're pulling the bag up or down, they smack together. So that's another great feature to keep those things nice and, and, and tight so they're not making any kind of rattling sounds. Yeah, one of the requirements Jim had is he likes to carry his inside the pack. 
So there's just enough volume um, for most antlers to be able to nest in the bottom of the pack, and then you can stuff everything on top of it, because usually you're going to take everything out, and what's the last thing you're probably going to get out? The antlers. Um, right. So uh, that's, that's it's everything. I try and think of the order of operations that you're going to go through, so all of the pocket configurations, uh, even the fact that the two smaller pockets Typically, most people hang their pack on their right side if they're they're a right-handed archer um, or a right-handed hunter. Um, and so the two smaller packs, the pockets on the outside are accessible to you, and then the one larger pocket uh, is uh, further away from you um, just because you're more likely to pull something out of those two smaller pockets. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful pack, beautiful system, and uh, it is very true. You know, when you get all done, all that stuff's out of the pack anyways. You know, like you guys mentioned, and that's just well thought out. Uh, usually, I, I, usually maybe my snacks are in there that's left, or who knows what else. But usually, it's very, very small, minimal items like that. So, how cool! Um, wonderful pack. And uh, is, another thing I noticed about it is is the the textile on that pack itself. It, it's super quiet. I mean, the fabric itself is is very seems to be very durable and it, it is ultra quiet. Yeah, it's the same Berber that the new Berber that we're releasing um, on the uh, the gear. Uh, so if you look at it, it's, it's going to be a Berber. It took the idea of kind of like if you if you've ever talked to any real you know some fanatical whitetail hunters, there's a lot of guys that would take like a little Berber knapsack for example, and they would it was just like a terrible design, but they they did it because it was quiet. So it took that same concept, but then put it into a real technical pack. And then on the base of it, uh, you're going to see a smooth textile. That's just so if you do set it up on down on the ground, it's not going to pick up snow or it's not going to pick up um, uh, like burrs or, or twigs or, or sticks. Uh, so if you, if you do happen to set it down, uh, we did map the textile across the base for that purpose. Yeah, that's awesome. I know there's like so much to talk about, Chris, and I want to basically – invite you to be back on the show and have you on multiple times throughout the year because there's n- I could talk. I love great gear, and uh, I think easily it would take us like four hours to cover the whitetail side of stuff. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, there's so much good stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's a fairly complex line, uh, and, and we realize that, but it's important that, uh, you know, depending on what type of hunting you're doing and what style of application, that, that we have a system that you can build that's right for you. Um, so, and, and, you know, that's, that's something that, that uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to help people to get an understanding of, of trying to figure out um, uh, what system's best for their style of hunting and then also their body chemistry. Yeah, for sure. I know there's, uh, I mean, there's, we're going to definitely talk more about it, but, I mean, from the base layer side to even the, the new system you guys launched last year that I want to kind of dedicate a show to as well, is the early uh, early what early is it how do you say it, Chris? I'm sorry. Yeah, early, early season, season whitetail or ESW. Yeah. ESW. Yeah. Uh, early season whitetail system, which I think is really unique, and um, you know I think a lot of guys kind of maybe will grimace at that, but if which now I get to go to Missouri, you know September 15th. I'll tell you it's hot. It's hot that time of year, believe it or not, still, and uh, or early season in Nebraska, and, and for us whitetail hunters. I mean, it is uh, a dream for that time of year. And like you said, it's just part of the system. And and the season changes, and, and basically your gear does. And that's the way I look at it. So I, I'm excited as well to talk about those items. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that down the road. That's, uh, that's a great uh, uh, a great story and, and how we validated, you know, even just, just to give it a high level. So I talked about gems. His is up in Alberta, great cold weather. You know, it's where I can get in early November. Um, some really cold conditions that you might get where you're from, for example, uh, late season. Um, but part of the validation we did of that was actually in Florida in July. So there's actually a rut on Seminole deer uh, that happens towards the end of July, early of August, uh, which a lot of people don't know about. Uh, and if you can think about the worst place in the world that you'd ever want to go uh, is uh, South Florida in July to hunt deer. Um, yeah, but no that's kidding. that's where where we went to go validate that. So, yeah, that's uh, that's brutal conditions. I mean, it's so funny to think of how brutal it is when it gets extremely cold. But man, it's it's brutal to kind of get comfortable in 
on that side of the scope as well. And uh, if you guys tested it there, that's going to be pretty cool to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I appreciate you having me on. Not a problem, Chris. Thanks so much. And uh, I know uh, I'll put this in the show notes, but for those that don't know, just let everybody know, Chris, where they can find Sitka Gear at. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of your, your local independent retailers, if you go to SitkaGear.com um, and you you pull up, uh, you can find your local dealer, um, uh, obviously, and then, uh, you know, the, the website it will be a great uh, place to get information. So uh, uh, just go there and check it out and see if you want to find a local retailer near you. Um, they'll, they'll be listed on the website. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Chris, and uh, looking forward to doing this again with you. Thank you very much.